A Japanese friend told me the other day that people there have resorted to a unique solution to Zoom fatigue. Rather than showing themselves on screen, they transform into kyara, which are both simpler and more legible than the usual human face, but at the same time more opaque, the mask they wish to show others behind which they conceal themselves. An interesting byproduct of this is that social discourse becomes smoother since one has no longer to try and read the air, as they say, of real-time social interactions. The virtual has thus become preferable to reality. Given what everyone around the world has been facing with the current pandemic, we are all living virtual lives in virtual worlds right now. Where would we be without the internet and our online presence? While our bodies are stuck to our chairs and couches, we are like ghosts surfing electronic realms of the imagination. Our sense of time and place has become untethered in an online space that is both everywhere and nowhere. As one who is a student of live performance in Japan, I am concerned about the future of this art in a world where bodies are latched to screens and prevented from gathering in public places. The pandemic has put a lot of people out of work, and some artists may never be able to return to the stage. Great art will be lost. Still, for already quite some time, the performing arts have been waging what seems forever like a losing battle with other media. With the introduction of every new technology, theater, music, dance, and other forms of live performance have had to adapt, redefine themselves, rediscover what is unique about their art and the resources that only they can exploit. The essence of live performance is immediacy, the here and now, something impossible in a world on screen. New media nonetheless present new opportunities for imaginative artists. The past decade in Japan has witnessed a significant revolution in live concerts and theater productions featuring characters from manga, anime, and the gaming worlds. This phenomenon whereby two-dimensional characters from the page or screen emerge into three-dimensional corporeality on stage while still maintaining the iconic superficiality of the kyara has been called 2.5 dimension culture. Productions of this nature have increased exponentially from as few as 31 shows in 2011 to over 100 in 2015 with overall attendance in the millions annually. Musicals like Tennis no Oji-sama, or the stage version of the popular anime King of Prism by Pretty Rhythm, have drawn more box office than any other kind of theater in recent times. Even Kabuki, an opportunistic commercial theater under the thumb of Shochiku Production Company, has got onto the bandwagon with productions like Naruto, One Piece, and the ultra kabuki show Hanakurabe Senbon Zakura, featuring vocaloid idol Hatsune Miku. These have won their, new, their stars new fans who would otherwise not have gone to see kabuki. Indeed, in an effort to reach audiences far beyond the capacity of any physical space, such shows have exploited live streaming long before COVID. Hatsune Miku's manifestation on stage is similar to the 2.5 dimension characters because her kyara is a mangafied embodiment of an artificial voice, which is then rendered as a kind of uh, holographic puppet. She appears on stage with human actors who themselves are performing kyara. Here, real, fictional, and virtual identities are superimposed, literally so in the case of Miku, whose ghostly image flickers over or behind or beside the human performers interacting with her. Suffice it to say here that Miku is a composite created out of a number of different technological platforms, synthetic vocal production, Vocaloid, file sharing on a community site called Piafro, computer graphics and animation, Miku Miku Dance, 3D virtual and augmented reality, open source 
video streaming, Nico Nico Dolga, and interactive video gaming. The secret to her popularity, and we should add Miku's very existence, is of course her user-generated content, making consumers also producers of the Miku phenomenon. She is, in a fundamental sense, created by her fans. Professor of Japanese popular culture at MIT, Ian Condry, has said, and I quote, it's history in the making, but it's not unique to Japan or animation. It's part of a broader process whereby media companies are focusing on creating platforms of participation rather than content for consumption. Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, Nikodo, Miku, these are all examples of platforms where users generate the content, the interaction, and the social networks bring these things to life. These platforms are embodied in a human simulacrum, which is as much the secret to Miku's appeal as is her synthetic voice. A virtual idol affords none of the problems posed by human idols, such as their sexual indiscretions, their drug, drug abuse. Being the spokes puppet of millions of fans, her output is practically infinite. But can one speak of an ontology of virtual creatures? Theater and media studies scholar Philip Auslander would say no. In his essay, Digital Liveness, he writes, and I quote, Liveness is not an ontologically defined condition, but a historically variable effect of mediatization. Auslander attempts to cut a Gordian knot entangling our discussions of the relationships between media and live performance and dispel questions regarding the ontological state of non-human entities. To be sure, like Moni Masahiro's Uncanny Valley, the line distinguishing the real from the unreal keeps getting moved by emerging technologies. The great playwright for puppets, Chikamatsu Monzaemon, stressed some three centuries ago that art is created in the slender margin between the real and the unreal. Auslander has argued, however, that actors like Andy Serkis, who played Gollum in The Lord of the Rings, should not be eligible for a best actor because it's computer graphics that essentially do the acting, and there is no Stanislavskian interiority to CG. In effect, says Auslander, only humans can act. But what are we to make of performances by robots and androids, or of the world's most prolific songwriter, Hatsune Miku? Here, I'd like to restore the confusion and complexity inherent in the nature of liveness and mediatization. Representations of non-living entities, puppets, ghosts, holograms of dead celebrities, and so on, inevitably bring us into a confrontation with the nature of Auslander's liveness. A number of Miku's own performances explicitly address the question of what it means to be alive. Her ambivalent ontological status instigates an existential crisis for her. The status of the image remains something of a mystery. As Marina Warner has written in Phantasmagoria, an image of a loved one and the loved one herself, quote, exist on the obscure frontier of materiality and immateriality. Does the frontier correspond to the mysterious, ungraspable frontier between matter of spirit, matter and spirit, between physical, invisible forms and the animating characters of persons, she asks? Digital media and computer graphics have confused the distinctions between the real and the virtual or augmented, between what is live and what is a mere shadow or reflection or trace. We may say that if it is on screen, it has been mediated, but new technologies of 3D projection and interactive media are confusing, if not breaking down the mimetic and ontological distinctions that we have so carefully created in the interests of preserving our own uniqueness as a species. Miku's initial release was in 27. Her first live concert was at the Anamelo Summer Live Festival at the Saitama Super Arena, 
with a capacity of 37,000 in August 2009, followed by her first overseas concert in Singapore in November the same year. Her live concerts have drawn thousands of fans worldwide, from Shanghai to San Juan, Costa Rica. She annually makes tours throughout East Asia, North America, and Europe, sometimes simultaneously, in a manner no human performer could. In 2014, she opened for Lady Gaga's world tour, and she's regularly appeared with popular Japanese and K-pop bands, too. A 3D CG control system now allows a conductor to control Miku's movements in real time, just like manipulating a puppet or teleoperating a robot, making her virtual performances with live actors and musicians seemingly seamless. Such is Miku's popularity that high culture has recruited her for various shows, especially as a poster child for Cool Japan. She's appeared in at least at least twice in concert with the Tokyo Philharmonic, as well as with the taiko drumming group Kodo. In July 2014, Miku collaborated with the National Bundaku Theatre on a vocaloid opera based on the no-play Aoi, taken from an episode in The Tale of Genji. In the vocaloid opera, Genji's wife Aoi becomes possessed by Midori, played by Miku, a modern manifestation of the jealous spirit of Lady Rokujo, one of young Genji's other lovers. The opera played at Hyper Japan, a festival of contemporary Japanese culture in London. The kabuki play ha Hanakurabe Senbon Zakura was inspired by a popular song written in 2011 for Miku called Senbon Zakura by a fan who goes by the handle Kuro Yusa P otherwise known as White Flame. With over 12 million views online, the song quickly rose to one of the most popular tunes for karaoke. The title was a nod to the classic 18th century puppet play Yoshitsune Senbon Zakura, Yoshitsune and the Thousand Cherry Trees. It is also one of the most popular plays in the kabuki repertoire. Shochiku premiered Hanakurabe featuring Miku and popular kabuki actor Nakamura Shido at Makuhari Mese, Chiba, on April 29th and 30th, 2016. A revival was staged at the same venue last April. NTT provided the projection mapping and other technology to create the augmented, augmented reality in which a virtual character could perform in sync with a live human actor. The Makuhari Mese seated up to 30,000 spectators, with thousands of others attending the show remotely on their screen and feverishly registering their approval in real time on Niko Niko Dolga, which was simultaneously projected on screen besides, beside the main stage as the show went on. The story zigzags over a vast range of Japanese history, from ancient times to a fictional Taisho 100 erasing the turbulent 20th century history of the Showa and Heisei eras. As the future of Japan manifests in her cherry trees, Hatsune Miku is being threatened by a foreign dragon spirit from the east. Shido plays the Japanese youth and avatar of a loyal retainer Fox Tada Nobu in the original Kabuki play, who comes time and again to Miku's rescue whenever she beats upon a drum made from the skins of his parents. Incidentally, Miku's name, Hatsune, first note, is um, derived from the drum's name in the puppet and Kabuki play. She sings from the chorus of the title song, a thousand cherries fade into the night, you sing, I dance, a festival or a banquet inside a steel cage, so blast away with your ray gun. The original Kabuki play's appeal is largely thanks to the consummate quick changes and other tricks called keren, here replicated in Miku's holographic appearance and other digital special effects. But this show is, quite frankly, a confusing mess concealing an ultranationalistic message about protecting the beauty of Japan from foreign invaders. The premiering of the play on April 29, a national holiday honoring the Showa Emperor, Hirohito, is surely no accident. 
equally egregious is Miku's poor acting. Veteran kabuki actors like Shido fare a little better, however, as they are flattened into Kyara themselves. Stanislavski, for one, would not have approved. I'm not saying that actors have to be human to move me, or that naturalism is the apogee of the dramatic art. I have been deeply moved in the puppet theater, but here the technological wizardry can't compensate for a muddled script and stilted acting, whether by humans or vocaloids. Miku, whom a pitchfork review has called a 21st century Pinocchio, also inspired Berlin-based electronic music and sound artists Laurel Halo and Mari Matstoya to create a musical ins installation piece called Be Still Here in 2016, premiering at the Transmedial CTM Festival in Berlin. An essay by Halo and Matstoya accompanying the installation reflected on Miku's parallel identities in the typical fashion of her creation, networked and collaborative. They write, and I quote, that the artists came together under the name of Hatsune Miku to explore a collective existence in a capital-driven society. As a commentary on the Miku phenomenon, the production seems to have offended a number of the Vocaloid's uh, followers. Write Halo and Matstoya. In making the piece, we had touched on the nerve endings of a powerful illusion and thus found ourselves caught in the crosshairs of Miku's most ardent fans, those passionate individuals, individuals so essential to her uroborotic celebrity. This hints that there may be a certain semiotic weight to the Miku phenomenon analogous to the Tinkerbell effect that doesn't translate beyond her fan fandom. Perhaps a better interpreter of her appeal to wider audiences has been Japan's father of electronic music, Tomita Isao. Tomita, whose work influenced the likes of Sakamoto Ryuichi and Stevie Wonder, famously saw no essential difference between acoustic and electronic music. Miku's synthetic voice afforded him unique possibilities as a composer. In an interview, Miku called, or Tomita called Miku the latest in a long tradition in Japan, what he called the family art, ohiege, of puppetry and ventriloquism. Like the Bundaku doll, she is the amalgam of what Roland Barthes called in The Empire of Signs, the three writings, the puppet, the manipulator, and the vociferant. Much of the aesthetic appeal of this art lies in the distribution and displacement of emotion over a range of expressive platforms, a technique which Bart compared to Bertolt Brecht's alienation effect. Tomita's Symphony Ikhatov, a medley based on stories and poems by the beloved children's writer Miyazawa Kenji, premiered at the Tokyo Opera City Concert Hall in November 2012, with Miku projected on stage behind an orchestra of acoustic and electronic instruments and a chorus of human singers. Kenji's fantasies um, lent themselves to the uncanny effect of Miku's synthetic voice, vacillating between the real and the unreal, life and death. Kenji's greatest work, the 1927 story, Night on the Galactic Railway, which recounts an after-death journey by two boys across the galaxy after falling into a river, constitutes the climax of Tomita's symphony. When he died, Tomita was working on what was marketed as a space ballet for Miku called Dr. Coppelius, based on E.T.A. Hoffman's story, Der Sandman. The ballet was posthumously performed at Bunkamura in Shibuya in November 2016. 
Hoffman's tale, first published in 1816, tells of a young man named Nathaniel who falls quite madly in love with an automaton created by the sinister Dr. Capellius. The work, which Freud famously analyzed in his study on the uncanny Das Unheimliche, 1919, would seem tailor-made for the 21st century's version of a mechanical doll. Miku may be no more alive than her performances are, but the status of her existence has dogged her since her creation. One of the diva's most popular songs is The Disappearance of Hatsune Miku, first released in 2008 on Nikodo by the fan Cosmo at Boso P. Let's call them Cosmo. Launching Miku full throttle into the song at 240 beats per minute, Disappearance is ranked the most difficult song to sing in karaoke. Cosmo created an album of the same name in 2010. Several other products, including a novel and computer games, have since been created. In the original, Miku sings, Ever since the day I was born, I've known I was a simulation, but I'll keep on singing till I'm destroyed. Some theories online cite the early crashing of Miku's servers due to so many hits as the catalyst for disappearance. The song goes on to speak of the anxiety that she feels in what Joni Mitchell called the star-making machine behind the popular song. Like the proverbial swan, Miku dies singing as her application malfunctions. Just as fan adulation creates an idol, it can also destroy one. Disappearance was no doubt the inspiration for a new vocaloid opera called The End, which premiered in May 2013. Playwright Okada Toshiki wrote the libretto with music by Shibuya Keiichiro, composer for the electronic band Attack, with a mise-en-scene by Shibuya and Yokobe Masaki, otherwise known as YKBX. Niku, whose miniskirts were designed by Marc Jacobs for Louis Vuitton, is got up like a gamine 60s go-go girl. The work was staged that fall at the Théâtre du Châtelet in Paris, and later in 2016 in Amsterdam and Hamburg. In turns hypnotic, bizarre, and disturbing, the end is a kind of fever dream in which Miku, in dialogue with a diabolical double and a big-eared cartoon mask, confronts her own mortality. Miku and her other kyara are projected onto a scrim behind which Shibuya sits at his synthesizer inside a kind of translucent tent whose hexagonal shape occasionally takes on the dimensions of a coffin. Three other screens upstage left and right are used to project other images, as it were, in a palimpsest. Borrowing a phrase from Antonin Artaud via Deleuze and Guattari, critic Sandra Annett states that a chiara like Miku is a body without organs, possessing no interiority, but only pure surface over which the disembodied desires of her fans can play. Miku's appeal to both men and women lies in her ethereal existence as an eternal 16-year-old girl in a tendency that Marshall McLuhan called angelism, the Cartesian desire in modern cultures to transcend the body altogether and become pure spirit. While fans might aspire to her immaculate, incorporeal essence throughout the opera, Miku embodies a profound nostalgia, a la Pinocchio or Data from Star Trek, to become human. And to be human, after all, is to be mortal. In one of the weirdest sequences in, in an altogether hallucinogenic work, Miku's mouth opens and we sail into her body like an endoscope down her esophagus to find that this body without organs actually has guts and a heart that can be stabbed. If Miku can die, and, spoiler alert, she does in the end, then she must have lived. But life for a vocaloid and for us during this pandemic, is still only virtual. Thank you.